Our uh, scripture reading this morning, our, our passage of scripture we're looking at is 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. But I'd like to read this a little bit in context. Um, so I'd like to begin reading in verse 10 through verse 17. And this, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, will be our text for today. And, and believe me, we're not going to get anywhere near close to exhausting everything that is uh, in it. So let's begin by reading uh, this passage, 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17. Again, let's give careful attention to this. This is God's Word. Paul writes to Timothy, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our uh, hearing this morning. <clears throat> now recently we heard the Lord tell us through Peter that we need to be ready at all times to give a defense for the faith, for the gospel, for the hope that we have to those who are outside the church, to those who will basically uh, hear what we, what we say as we evangelize. Uh, see how we live, that how we live is different than um, uh, the way the world lives, and want to know why we are different, why it is we have the hope of heaven. Now, Jesus told us that one of the most powerful arguments that we can present to the world for the truth of the gospel is the love that he gives to us for them, but also especially for our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how Jesus tells us in Matthew 5.16 that we are to let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. This is really what he's talking about. This supernatural love that he has given to us in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to love our neighbor, to love even our enemy. But again, especially those who are the household of the faith, Jesus says when they see that, they will know that we are his disciples. Now, we were reminded last week that we also need to be ready to do the same thing within the church. Our Lord tells us through Jude that we are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And I think if we, as we read the gospel, or it's not the gospel, but the, the letter of Jude... <laughs> Uh, we see that it is in the context of the church that he is writing. He's writing to his audience to contend for that truth because of the people who have crept in to that congregation, to that fellowship, who are ungodly. Now, what we need to see here is that Satan attacks from within the church as well as from without and he can attack within the church. He knows that he can because he knows that not everybody in the church is actually a genuine believer. We know the visible church, those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are a mixed multitude. Not everybody is saved. Satan also knows that not everybody in the visible church is actually grounded in the truth. So he knows that there are people in the church that he can deceive. Now that, by the way, is the reason why over the years so many cults have actually come out of the church. Movements, and, and by the way, this is the definition of a cult, 
a, a movement that wants to profess to be, in this is the case, a Christian cult. Uh, they want to be Christians. They profess that they are Christians, but they deny one or more of these fundamental, foundational truths of the gospel. In other words, they have destroyed the gospel. They have rejected the gospel, but they still want to believe that they are Christians. Now, let me give you a few examples of this. Some of them were actually surprising uh, to me. Islam. You know, Islam is a Judeo-Christian cult, you know, that Muhammad lived around the 5th, 6th century. And he was influenced by Christianity, but sadly, the wrong kind. Very early in life, he was influenced by a heretical Aryan Gnostic monk. Not the kind of monk you want to run into, okay? Aryan means he denied the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Gnostic, meaning that they deny that really the material world is good and that Jesus couldn't have been uh, fully human. Uh, the monk's name was Bahira or Sergius, and Muhammad was influenced by that, and out of this comes the Islamic religion, which is a major contender against the church. Uh, Roman Catholicism is a branch of the historic Christian church that may, this may shock people, but it officially became a cult at the Council of Trent when they pronounce an anathema on those who believe that they are saved by grace through faith alone. That qualifies them as a Christian cult. They want to claim to be Christians. And I'm not saying there aren't Christians within the Roman Catholic Church, but the system itself is a cult because it denies a foundational principle of the gospel that we are saved by grace alone. They believe that, but not by faith alone. They think that there are works that we have to do. They have added works to salvation. They fall under the anathema that Paul pronounces in the book of Galatians. The Jehovah's Witness organization was founded by Charles Taze Russell. Do you know that he originally was a Presbyterian? And then he went to Congregationalism. And then when he didn't find what he was looking for there, he went to Eastern religion. And then he went to Adventism, which is a forerunner of Seventh-day Adventism, which has still has some very serious problems in it. And then he founded what is known today as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, from which you get the idea of Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses. He came out of the church. Mormonism was founded by Joseph Smith, who was taught the Christian faith by his parents, but he rejected it and basically developed his own fantasy faith. Even from its infancy, the New Testament church, as we've already seen over the past couple of weeks, was plagued with teachings that strike at the heart of the gospel. For instance, the Judaizers taught, again in the book of Galatians, but we also see it in Acts 15, that faith in Jesus was not enough to save us, not enough to justify us. You also have to be circumcised, if you're a male, and observe the law of Moses. Uh, Proto-Gnosticism, this forerunner to this Gnostic idea that eventually became Gnosticism, was addressed by John in his first letter who denied the human nature of Jesus Christ. And both of those things, you know, the Judaizers and these pre-Gnostics, destroy the gospel by changing things that are fundamental to the gospel. Are we saved by grace through faith alone? Are we saved by a, a Savior who is both God and man, or is he only appear to be a man? Now, as we look to the history of the church, and actually, if you join us on Wednesday evenings, as we go through the history of the church, you'll see there were many more cultic movements that have come out of the Christian church throughout the centuries, and they continue to do so today. And the reason why all this is happening is because the devil is very good at what he does. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. That's why Jude tells us we need to contend for the faith, especially the foundational fundamental truths of the gospel, which are the ones that Satan loves to attack. We need to do this for our own sakes so that we do not drift away from the truth. Remember that most of these cults are actually populated by people who have come through the Christian church. But we also need to be grounded in these fundamentals for the sake of our brothers and sisters who also might be deceived by Satan or by his people who come to our door or who influence us perhaps from other avenues. Now these foundational principles, again, I would remind you, are these, that the Bible is God's word, 
that God is triune, that man is fallen and in danger of eternal judgment and punishment, that Jesus is God and man who lived and died and rose again for us and for our salvation. There's much more to that, of course, much more to that work. And that we receive the salvation that Jesus has worked out by grace alone. It's a free gift of God. Received by faith alone, not through any works of ours. We don't add to it. But remember, by a faith that is not alone, a faith that produces works of love. Now today we're going to look at the foundation of the foundational principles that the Bible is the Word of God. You know, Satan knows that if he can attack this and destroy our confidence in this, then he can destroy all the other foundational principles in one fell swoop. We must be convinced that the Bible is his Word if we are to hold, you know, believe and hold on to all the foundational principles because they are taught in this book which is God's Word. It is our only authoritative source of what we are to believe regarding God and how it is God wants us to live. Now, this morning what we're going to do is we're going to consider some of the reasons why we believe the Bible is God's Word. And this evening, we'll, we'll pick up that topic again, but we're also going to see what that means, that the Bible is His Word, and why it's important that we believe it is. And I've already told you some of the reasons why. So first... Why do we believe the Bible is God's Word? Now, Satan, as we've already noted, is going to do everything in his power to try to convince us, as I've already said, that the fundamentals of the gospel are not true. But because this principle is the foundation of all the others, this is the one he's going to attack the most. He's not going to spare any effort to try to discredit it. And I just want to point out now, it shouldn't be surprising to us, that every single cult, if you've ever interacted with any cult members or, or read their literature or writings about them, every single Christian cult seeks to undermine the Bible either by rejecting it out of hand or portions of it or adding further revelations to it. Does that sound familiar? Now, Islam teaches that the Bible is corrupted. You know, no big surprise there. Now, they do believe that the writings of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Gospels are inspired. Moses, David, and Jesus are true prophets. But everything else that's in the Bible is essentially a work of man and should be rejected. Now, they further believe that Allah, which is the, their name for their, their God, has given another book, additional revelation, by an even greater prophet, Muhammad, to correct the Bible that's called the Quran. So again, rejecting the Bible, adding additional revelation to it. Do you know the Catholics do exactly the same thing? They believe that what we have is, is the Bible, is at least part of it, but it's not complete. They added several other books called the Apocrypha. And I, they did that at the Council of Trent in order to support a particular doctrine, their doctrine of purgatory. They also have what they call the apostolic tradition, which they believe was preserved in the writings of the apostolic and the church fathers. They believe in continuing tradition, which is revealed in the ecumenical councils of the church and the edicts of the pulp as he speaks in his teaching capacity. So they have the Bible plus the Apocrypha plus apostolic tradition plus continuing tradition. The Bible isn't enough. They have to add to it. So again, they have distorted it. The truth of God. Jehovah's Witnesses undermine the Bible's authorities, you know, by making their own translation of the Bible. It's really a version of the Bible, a perversion of the Bible, if I can put it that way, because nobody did a fresh translation. When they did this, they took the King James Version. They went through it. I think it was Charles Taze Russell. And he tried to eliminate every reference in that Bible to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have changed it. They have altered it to make it say what they wanted to say. Mormons undermine the Bible by denying any part of it that contradicts their belief system. If you try to counter them at the door and you say, you believe this, okay, you realize the Bible teaches this, they'll tell you. Well, that isn't right. What the Bible says there isn't right. It wasn't translated properly. It was corrupted by the Roman Catholic Church. You can't trust what it says here. Also, we have the writings of our prophet, Joseph Smith, 
and these correct these errors. We have the truth from his lips. So basically, they, they only choose the parts of the Bible that fit their system. And then they add to it other revelation, supposed revelation. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, too, that the health and wealth, victorious living movements, also undermine the Bible's authority. And they do it by quoting passages out of context, twisting their meaning, and making them to appear what they want it to say. Neo-Orthodoxy, we talked about that before. It undermines the Bible by claiming that it only contains the Word of God, but it isn't the Word of God, and that the parts that are His Word are actually different for everyone, and actually they're different for everyone at different times. Whatever happens to inspire you is the Word of God. Otherwise, it's just a dead letter of men. Now, we can, of course, add to this. Again, everyone who attacks the Christian faith has to attack the Bible. Deists deny that God ever gave such a word as the Bible, that he, he created the universe, wound it up, and then he withdrew. He never communicated in any other way but through natural revelation. The liberals and the atheists deny that God even exists. So how could this possibly be the word of a being that doesn't exist? But again, who's behind all of these errors? Who's behind all this deception? It's Satan. This is the net effect of Satan's influence, which is to make man think that he can sit in judgment on God's word, making it say what they want it to say, rather than really letting the word of God sit in judgment upon them, which is listening and submitting to what the word of God actually says. Now, it's over against this that we need to fortify ourselves in our confidence that the Bible is his word, for our own salvation and growth and grace. Now, maybe you're convinced the Bible is the Word of God this morning. That's good, because you need to be to be a Christian. But we need to also, as we saw through Jude, know how to defend the Word of God well enough to defend it in the church for the well-being of our brothers and sisters who might be led astray or those who already have been led astray into these other cults. Now, let me just say this. The Lord certainly will never allow any of his children ultimately to fall away. But one of the ways that God prevents that from taking place is through his word. Trusting that his word is his word, listening to it and submitting to it is the way that God preserves us from falling away. But the reason why we don't fall away is because we believe what it says is true. And we hold on to this truth and we don't let anyone... Take it away from us. So what we need to do is ground ourselves even more, not only for our own sakes, but also for the sakes of others, that we might be able to help them. So how can we defend the Bible? Why do we believe that it is God's Word? Now, you know, the first reason that I want us to look at is, is really an interesting one, uh, but really perhaps the most powerful one when you consider what the Bible actually is. The reason why we believe that the Bible is the Word of God is because it, it makes that claim. That's what it claims to be, the Word of God. Now, in our passage, Paul writes this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, in tra for training in righteousness. Now, what was it that Paul was talking about here when he referred to Scripture? He was certainly referring to the entire Old Testament. I believe that's what Paul had in mind here. But also the writings, the word scripture applies more broadly to the writings. That's what the word scripture actually means. The writings of the apostles and their close associates. Now we don't have time to review all the evidence to show how all the books of the New Testament essentially uh, vindicate, validate, verify one another when you consider, when they were considering the writings of, of the other authors and also how the early church viewed the scriptures. They recognized the writings of the apostles and their associates as being of a different character and quality than their own writings. They considered it to be scripture. They considered it to be the word of God. But let me just give you one example of how Peter viewed the letters of Paul. He writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 15 through 16. 
and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, of which are some hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Now I want you to notice two things from this passage. The most obvious one is that Peter calls Paul's writing scripture. Peter recognized what Paul was writing as the word of God. But notice a second thing here. What he says at the end. He says there are those who distort it. There are those who change what it says. Change its meaning. And he says that if they do this, it leads to their destruction. Why do we believe that people who are in cults are in danger? It's because they have twisted the scriptures. And in twisting them, they have destroyed themselves. Unless they can see the truth and come out of that error and believe in the Lord Jesus and follow him. It's important that we believe scripture. But again, the point here is that Peter calls Paul's writing scripture. Now, <clears throat> again, it is scripture, and it claims to be scripture. At first glance, this, the fact that the Bible does this might not seem like a very compelling argument, but it actually is perhaps the most, what do you want to say, um, we could say, not say irrefutable, but it certainly is perhaps one of the most compelling and powerful arguments. And the reason is this, because it is the Word of God, okay? And whatever it says is true. And do you realize that on the day of judgment, that God is going to hold every single person accountable who has one of these to have listened to what it actually says? Because he has spoken. This is his word. And if they have read it and they've seen it or they have heard it, God's going to hold them accountable. We do not have the right to sit in judgment on the word of God. We only can submit to the word of God. That's what the Lord intends for us to do. Now, again, that's simply the first argument. We know that there are not a few books that people claim to be God's Word. The Quran, the writings of Joseph Smith, and the Catholic tradition, and there are other books as well. And they're going to perhaps try to use the same argument. We, we believe God spoke here, and we should submit to it because God spoke, but obviously God didn't speak there. The question is, why do we believe the Bible's claim is valid, you know, but theirs is not? Well, let me give you some of the reasons, and some of these we've already seen. And the first one, I just want to re reiterate, because I think it's really a powerful argument that we often overlook. First of all, that it was written by such a numerous uh, authorship, over 40 people, over 40 authors, and such a diverse authorship, some were shepherds, farmers, fishermen, kings. Over so many years, over 1,500 years, but they wrote with a complete unity on what has proven to be perhaps the most controversial subject in the history of the world. Do you realize that when you read the Bible and you, you look at the inspired writings that there is no debate? We don't find debate among the authors of, of Scripture. It's like... Peter writing saying, well, Paul wrote this, but he's wrong. It's really this. And, you know, Jesus said this, but it really isn't this. It's really this. We don't find that kind of thing in the Bible. We see everyone agreeing on what the truth actually is. Now, no other religion can say regarding their inspired writings that they actually agree. As a matter of fact, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is always trying to cover its tracks because of the decrees and edicts of the Pope and so forth. And he comes out with something and then their theologians have to try to harmonize it with everything that's come before when it's probably, in many cases, flat out contradictory. You, you can't, there is not agreement. There is only smoke and mirrors, I guess you might say, as they try to make it agree. But there is perfect unity and agreement in the Bible. That is amazing. That is miraculous, as a matter of fact. Uh, secondly, that the areas that we can actually uh, prove or disprove scientifically through archaeology with regard to places, persons, or things. Nothing has ever been disproven by archaeology, but everything has, as a matter of fact, been confirmed 
by archaeology. Now, if you were to apply that same test to the Mormon's Book of Mormon, uh, it would not stand up because nothing the Book of Mormon actually claims with regard to people, places, or things has ever even been discovered through archaeology. As a matter of fact, the book gives every mark, every sign of being complete and pure fiction. As a matter of fact, we, we believe that the origin of the Book of Mormon, and of course they wouldn't like to hear this, was that uh, somebody wrote it as a story to teach his child Christianity. And Joseph Smith got a hold of it and made it his translation of these mythical golden tablets that were translated by these magic spectacles that allowed him to read the reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics on these gold tablets. You see how big the Book of Mormon is? I mean, it's, it's substantial. It's got, it's got a lot of pages in it. Can you imagine how many gold tablets it would take to write that in, re in reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics? He, he would need probably several bulldozers to move the tablets to where he could even translate them. It, it just is fiction, okay? But the Bible has shown to be absolutely accurate in everything that it says. The Bible furthermore holds out to us the highest ethical standards that have ever been seen among mankind. As a matter of fact, an ethic or a standard so high that no one has ever been able to keep it or could possibly keep it except for one man, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know. And the fact is that men do not write books that make it impossible for them to make it into heaven, you see. They don't, they don't X themselves out of the kingdom of heaven. They write books that allow them to get into heaven. But the Bible actually excludes everyone from heaven and only allows one way through one perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we looked at the transmission of the scriptures, from the time of its completion down to the present day, the amazing accuracy and preservation, if we were to compare it with, with the religious writings of other uh, religions and see how much they have been corrupted, this is nothing less than amazing. Among the 5,000 manuscripts we have of the New Testament, there's only one half of 1% variation among all the manuscripts nothing of which affects any major or minor teaching of Scripture. But because we have so many witnesses, these manuscripts are copies of the original autographs, because we have so many witnesses to what the original autographs actually said, we can deduce what the original autographs actually did say. And the point is this. It shows that the God who was pleased to give us His Word was also concerned to keep it pure, and that's exactly what he did. Now, finally for this morning, one of the most powerful ways that it shows itself to be God's Word is through the many predictions that are contained in it of what would take place hundreds or thousands of years before these events actually took place with amazing accuracy. Now, I found this quote on the Ligonier website by Stephen Larson. And it was from a message that he gave at a 2010 national conference entitled, Fulfilled Prophecy Demonstrates the Divine Inspiration of Scripture. And I think it'll help us to see this point in, in a summary form, but it is a rather lengthy quote, but it's, it contains a lot of information. I just want to say two things about it before I begin. Um, it, it do, it's going to be, I think, more powerful if you recognize all the references that he makes because he doesn't quote the scriptures, he simply gives the content of it. And secondly, uh, this is not a writing, but this is a transcript of something he actually said, which means it's not going to be in the best English. You know how it is when you... <laughs> everything that's said in, in extemporaneous teaching, preaching is not always going to be perfect English, but I do think it's very powerful. There's a lot of information here and a lot of good argumentation. And I think a good summary of this particular point. So let me go ahead and read it. And with this, I really want to close this morning. This is what he says. The fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. We could just believe that the Bible is the word of God on this one point alone. This is staggering. Say, do you realize that at the time the Bible was written, 27% of the Bible was prophetic. There are some 1,817 prophecies of some nature in the Bible at the time the author wrote the scripture. A prophecy is 
pre-written history. Only God knows the future. And the reason that God knows the future is because God has foreordained the future. God's not looking down the tunnel of time to see anything because God already knows everything. And God has already foreordained everything and he records some of it for us in the scripture. And we read all kinds of prophecies regarding individuals that Abraham would have a son. Did he? In his latter years. That there would be rulers like Cyrus of Persia. 100 years before Cyrus assumed the throne, his name in Isaiah 45 verse 1 is recorded. Would you like to predict who the president of the United States will be 100 years from today? It's impossible. But here is the Bible giving name and country of these rulers long before they're even birthed and come onto the scene. Or nations such as the fall of the northern kingdom. Or the length of Judah's captivity. Or empires regarding the fall of Babylon or cities such as the destruction of Tyre, etc., etc., etc. There is a mounting case of evidence that substantiates the perfect truthfulness of the word of God. There are no other books in the world that are doing this. How about the prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? The greatest fulfillments of prophecies are found at the first coming of Christ, not even the second coming, but at the first coming. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would be born of the seed of Abraham, Jesse, and David. He would be born of a virgin called Emmanuel, born in Bethlehem. Great persons would come to adore him. There would be the killing of children in Bethlehem. He would be called out of Egypt. He would be preceded by a forerunner. He would be anointed with the Holy Spirit. He would be a prophet like Moses, a priest after the order is now Melchizedek. He would be entering into his public ministry in Galilee. He would be entering publicly into Jerusalem and come into the temple. He would live in poverty and meekness, tenderness and compassion. He would be without deceit. He'd be full of zeal, preaching with parables, working miracles, bearing reproach. He would be rejected by his own Jewish brethren. The Jews and Gentiles would combine together against him. He would be betrayed by a friend. His disciples would forsake him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, and that price would be given for a potter's field. He would die with intense suffering, yet be silent under that suffering. He would be struck on the cheek. His visage would be marred. He would be spit upon and scarred. His hands and feet would be nailed to the cross. He would be forsaken by God. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would be mocked. Gall and vinegar would be offered to him. His garments would be parted. Lots would be cast for his clothing. He would be numbered among the transgressors. He would intercede for his murderers. He would die, but not a bone of his body would be broken. He would be pierced long before crucifixion would even ever be invented. He would be buried with the rich. His flesh would not see corruption. He would be raised from the dead. He would ascend back to the right hand of God the Father. All of this recorded hundreds of years before Jesus ever entered this world. And many of these prophecies are not fulfilled by his friends but by his enemies who stand to lose the most with their fulfillment. And many of these prophecies being fulfilled before he was born while he's in his mother's womb and while he is in the grave. Interesting compilation, isn't it? Again, he's saying this was predicted. All these things were predicted before it actually came to pass, but came to pass with amazing accuracy. And again, I would draw your attention to the fact, he says that perhaps the most amazing thing, is you don't have a bunch of his, of his followers running out here trying to make sure everything is fulfilled according to Scripture. You have his enemies doing it. The people who knew what the Scripture said, who had the most to gain by those not being fulfilled, there was nothing they could do to stop it, and they actually did what it was predicted they would do. Now again, the question is, how could the authors predict the future unless they knew the future. And who knows the future but the God who planned it? Now again, there, there are yet other, perhaps even more powerful reasons we should believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we're going to continue to look at those this evening, as well as what that means, that the Bible is God's Word, and why it's important that we believe that it is. 
But we're going to close for now. And I hope that as I've been reading through this section about everything that was predicted that Jesus was going to go through, that you were thinking about this as well. Jesus actually did go through these things. And he did them for everyone who will trust in him. Everybody who will ultimately receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, bow down to him and love him and follow him all the days of their lives. Now, that is what the Lord's table is reminding us of again, is the fact that Jesus did these things, but he did them for us if we are trusting in him this morning. The table reminds us of his great love and his mercy towards us. So let's take just a few moments, shall we, and bow in silent prayer. And let's ask the Lord to, um, again, uh, confirm with, within us, confirm to us, and, and strengthen our conviction that the Bible is his word. What it says is true. Jesus really did go through the things that he went through. If we are trusting him, he really has saved us by his sacrifice. And as you know, as we come to the table, we do need to examine our hearts with regard to our trusting Jesus and also as to whether or not we are turning from our sins, repenting of all of our sins. So let's make sure we do that as well as we prepare to come. So let's spend just a couple moments in prayer.